Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Paul Travels Virtually There. Um, actually, no, let me just rephrase that. Welcome to Paul Travels Virtual Escapes series. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Thursday. <laughs> I'm Rhonda Sfia, I'm the Leisure Manager with Paul Travel, and co-hosting with me today is Julie Beck-Dash. Hi, Hi, Julie. Everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today and spending a little time with us doing a little daydreaming. You know, I think it's always fun to really think about where our next vacation might be and uh, what kind of experiences we all want to have, or perhaps we just reminisce about holidays past because that's what we're doing these days, thinking about where we've been and what we, what kind of, you know, experiences we have and, you know, what we want to do next. So thank you so much for joining us. We're, we hope that these uh, travel series um, really gives you a chance to escape for an hour and uh, be informative and inspiring. Now, just in case you've missed any of our previous webinars, you can visit our website, so uh, paultravel.com slash webinars. You'll see all of our past webinars that we've done, and I believe this is our 23rd or 24th, so there's some really great content, um, and if you've missed any or just take a little look to see what you might be interested in, so please visit our website. Also, um, you know, if you want to register for our upcoming webinars, you can register on our website and you can also do that on any of our newsletters that we send out as well. And we, those generally come out on a weekly basis. If you have any friends that might be interested in attending one of the webinars, um, please forward our information on to them. You know, the more the merrier. It would be uh, really great to, to have um, everybody have the opportunity to, to see what we've been doing. Uh, so uh, our upcoming webinar, just before we get into today, which is quite exciting, um, is going to be next Thursday, the 22nd of October. We're bringing it a little bit early at 10 a.m. Um, on Thursday morning, and it's going to be on Anguilla, which is one of my favorite Caribbean islands, and a close island to Anguilla, uh, the French side of St. Martin. So mark that on your calendars and uh, register if you can, so it'll be a, a great little uh, visit to some sun and sand, which I think we're all going to be ready for. <laughs> for today, um, we're going to be bringing Belgium. Um, you know, a beautiful little country in Europe. I know it's not all just chocolate and uh, uh, waffles. There's so much more to it. Um, so today's going to be really exciting. And just before I turn it over to Julie, um, and she's going to introduce our wonderful guest, and we're so happy to have him here. Um, if anybody has any questions at all during the presentation, everybody is um, been muted out. So um, to answer any questions, please put it in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen and we'll make sure we get to all those questions at the end of the presentation and and make sure all of uh, everybody has been answered so that'd be great and please 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 ask any questions there's no bad questions or any comments that you might have put them in the chat maybe you've been before maybe there's a great little spot or restaurant you would recommend uh, we'd love to hear from you so be really good so so Julie have you been to to Belgium at all I know myself I was on a coach tour you know, the ones that you see 30 countries in 10 yeah. days kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's spent, a blur. Yeah, in a blur. I spent one day in Brussels, but, you know, there's just so much more. Bruges is a place I'd love to see, too. Same so here. how about you? Have you uh, had a no, chance? No, I have not been yet, but um, I do. I would also love to go. Um, and I feel like I, I echo you. Your thoughts were virtually there. I feel like I'm virtually yeah. in Belgium now. Exactly. <laughs> And I have to say, I love the the strawberry fruly beer, the the Belgian beer. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. So that's great. Yeah, today with us we have Marco Frank, and he is from the um, Flanders Belgium um, Tourist Board. Uh, he has. Um, he's in charge of marketing the Flanders Belgium region to and he works closely with tour operators and travel agencies to let us know what the best experiences are so that we can pass those along to you to our clients so to make sure you're having the best time possible so uh, Marco he he's I'm going to call him her our honorary Canadian today because he yeah. has lived in Canada he's been to a Edmonton mall and um, even been on the radio in uh, in Edmonton that <laughs> he was telling us yesterday so yeah 
Finn, he knows Canada really well, and um, he's uh, he has a background in luxury river cruising, and he just has a wealth of knowledge in business development and marketing, and we're just really excited to have you with us today, Marco. So yeah. we'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you so much, Rhonda. So without further ado, let's just uh, dive in Perfect. to our virtual journey. Let me just uh, share my screen with everybody. And uh, great. Let's get the presentation started. So today we'll take a virtual trip to Belgium and primarily to the Flemish, the Flanders part of Belgium. Uh, let me just show you at the beginning a little bit of an introductory video. Uh, the first one is a short video that gives you a little bit of an impression what it is to arrive in a destination. And you would typically arrive into Brussels airport. <laughs> So that was a little bit of a teaser, um, what it feels like to arrive in Brussels at the airport. And now that we've arrived, what is actually there to see? And again, it's a quick summary video and then in going forward, we'll explore everything in a little bit more detail. This is Flanders one of Europe's hidden gems. Well, obviously we've hidden it a little too well because a lot of people can't seem to find it. But don't worry, we're here to help. Flanders is right here, in Belgium, between France and the Netherlands. Flanders is situated in the heart of Europe. Although it can be hard to find on a map, it's incredibly simple to get to. By plane, for example, through our biggest airport, the one in Brussels, called Brussels Airport. As Flanders is part of the Schengen area, you can get there from another European country without border checks. Easy, right? But do you know what's even easier? Staying in Flanders and discovering the region by train, bus, car, bike, horse, Segway? Nah, that just looks silly. This is better. Would you like to know more about Flanders? Great! Go to visitflanders.com This... All right, so that was a little bit of a teaser. What we will cover today, uh, three big blocks. So we'll talk a little bit about geography. We'll keep it uh, very brief, very short because we've already learned a little bit about it during this video. Uh, in the second part, uh, we'll talk about our core travel experiences that uh, you can actually experience when you visit the destination, uh, primarily our art and heritage. We'll dive into the gastronomy. We'll talk about cycling, uh, fashion and design, and then wrap it up with uh, historic World War I sites. You know, think of John McRae, Flanders Fields. And then in the last part, we'll also go a little bit into the off the beaten path experiences and a little bit of additional practical information. So let's just uh, get started with uh, the geography. So Flanders is basically the northern region of uh, Belgium. 
And if I say Northern region, you can literally compare it to a province in Canada. So it's a, like a province. Uh, the difference is Belgium is a very tiny country. So we only have, so to speak, two provinces. So there's us Flanders and then the other province in the south, which is Wallonia. The tourist office only covers the Flemish part because all of Belgium has no national tourist office. It's only provincial tourist offices. Uh, but by me talking about uh, Flanders only and not so much about the other part of Belgium, um, we're not really missing out on a lot because the experiences are very similar across the whole country. And also if you look at how many uh, Canadians go to the Flemish part versus uh, the Walloon part, it's actually 95% of uh, Canadian arrivals into Belgium actually visit the Flemish part of the country. Uh, there are six major cities uh, in the center. We got the capital of Europe, the capital of Belgium, the capital of Flanders, which is Brussels. Uh, to the north of Brussels, we get the seaport city of Antwerp. Then when you move over to the coast on the western side of the country, you got Bruges. Uh, in between Bruges and Brussels, we have the city of Ghent. And then two smaller cities nestled around Brussels called Mechelen and Leuven. The total population of Flanders is about 2.8 million inhabitants. If you want to know the size of Flanders, because that everything is very much smaller and want to compare to anything uh, in Canada, it's approximately two times the greater Toronto area. So if you are familiar with the GTA, it's two times the GTA. Uh, we are literally in the heart of Europe. If you look at the map here, Paris, London, Amsterdam, Cologne, all those cities are less than two hours away. So if you do want to plan a multi-European uh, vacation, multi-destinations in Europe, it's very easy to travel from Paris to Brussels, from London to Brussels. Uh, Paris is actually the closest in terms of travel time. It's one hour, 22 minutes by train. London is one hour, 48. Amsterdam is one hour, 50. And then Cologne is one hour and 40. So very, very easy to combine us and other European destinations in one single trip. So let's talk about our five core travel themes next. And I casually refer to them as our usual suspects um, because you've probably heard of Belgium beers and you've heard of some great medieval cities of Bruges and Ghent. Um, so you've heard of them one way or another. So they are our usual suspects, but we'll dive a little bit more into the details. So let's talk about the art and the heritage. And that is very important because the art and the heritage is still very much present um, in the destination. Uh, and that's a lot of the reasons why people wanna see the old medieval Europe, the plaza, squares, castles, cathedrals, cobblestones, and that's what you get to see. What you see here is a photo of the Grand Plaza in Brussels, uh, which is UNESCO World Heritage. It's one of the nicest, best preserved squares in all of Europe. The photo actually shows you the flower carpet that happens every two years in August. Unfortunately, the 2020 flower carpet did not happen because of obvious reasons. Uh, and then the next one is scheduled for 2022. You will see magnificent cities like Bruges here, which is also UNESCO World Heritage. Picture yourself, you know, taking a canal boat ride, wandering around in a medieval city the same way the city was 700 years ago. Uh, you will get to see a lot of old buildings, old architecture. Um, you get to explore art galleries, art museums, a lot of the old art is still very much present in the destination. Uh, for example, the Ghent altarpiece here in the city of Ghent. Uh, this altarpiece is considered the first uh, Northern Renaissance painting. If you're familiar with the Renaissance, you know there was the Southern Italian Renaissance and also then in the Northern Renaissance. And the Jan van Eyck brothers painted this build uh, picture and is considered one of the first paintings. 
And if you think, I might have seen this painting somewhere, somehow, it sounds familiar. Yes, you've probably seen it in a 2014 movie. Uh, that depicted a true story. At the end of World War II, the Nazis take all the art. They want to destroy it, uh, burn it, blow it up. And then the American GIs have a company that is sent into uh, the combat zone and they have to recover the artwork and then bring it back to Belgium. So it's a true story, it really happened. And that movie is known as The Monuments Man. So if you've not seen the movie, it's actually based on, on a true story. It came out in 2014. It's definitely worth uh, watching it for historic reasons. There's also a lot of you know, the old ateliers and, and houses of the painter still uh, well preserved. Here you see the atelier Peter Paul Rubens. But don't worry, it's not just old art, old architecture that you get to see. There's also modern art, modern architecture, if that is up your alley. For example, what you see here is the uh, Port Authority in the Port of Antwerp. And that makes a very eclectic mix of the old and the new. Let's move on to gastronomy, our second usual suspect. So Flanders is literally in the heart of Europe, as I've shown you on the map. So we really combine a lot of different influences in the kitchen of Flanders from all around Europe, from all around the world. You know, think of the Belgian beers, and we'll talk about that in a second, a little bit more detail. Uh, there's a lot of different Belgian beers out there that come in a lot of different flavors and varieties. There's very unique fermentation processes there that make or support all those different varieties. Uh, very interestingly, in Belgium, every beer has its own glass. So you cannot serve different beers in the same type of glass because every beer needs a different amount of air to breathe. And Belgians take beer very seriously. Just the French take the wine very seriously. Uh, you can experience a lot of food and beer pairings, and that's really hot, really in. So when you go to a restaurant, have an amazing meal, you can uh, easily pair that with the right beer, and there's uh, beer suggestions for your food. Uh, there's a lot of uh, traditional breweries uh, that are very old. You can visit those breweries, do a brewery tour. You can go to brewery museums, beer museums, uh, a lot of beer cafes. And needless to say, there's also a lot of beer festivals and beer tours, beer walking tours, beer events. So if you are into beer, that is definitely a destination where you want to go to. How many different beers and breweries do we have? Latest count, about 160 different breweries in Belgium. Somewhere between 16 to 700 different beers. Personally, I lost track. I tried to sample every single one of them. I just can't keep up to so many different beers out there. Over 20 million hectoliters of beer are brewed every year in Belgium. Uh, the world's largest beer brewing company is from Flanders. Uh, officially, the company is known as Anheuser Busch Inbeth, Inbrew, Interbeth Beverages. They are best known for their original brand, Stella Artois. But Stella Artois is no longer the company name. It's just the, the name of the beer brand. And they also made a lot of inroads uh, into Canada as well. Um, you know, La Butte was purchased by them in the 90s. Uh, the best beer, top best beer cafes are in Flanders. There's a lot of international awards for our beers. And least but, last but not least, uh, Belgian beer is actually a recognized UNESCO World Heritage. So... Don't be afraid to drink Belgian beers. You are drinking UNESCO World Heritage. Some inspirational images. And so that's really done in a casual way. Uh, sometimes I get asked, you know, what is the difference between uh, German beer culture, because Germany also has a lot of beer, and Belgian beer culture. And then the, the difference is very clear in a sense that in Germany, it's all about the big beer steins and Oktoberfest and drinking big quantities. In Belgium, it's about small quantities and savoring it taking your time, exploring the different flavors and tastes in the beer. Moving on to chocolate, Belgium is definitely a chocolate nation, a chocolate country, lots of different uh, chocolatiers out there, chocolate experiences. 
we really eat and breathe chocolate. Over 660,000 tons of chocolates are produced every single year. There's a lot of innovative chocolate products out there. Um, shocking combinations. Uh, there's a couple of chocolates that I personally know that have worked in Asia and are now bringing back Asian flavors and working them into their chocolates. You think wasabi and chocolate doesn't go together? Yes, it does. It makes a very interesting combination. Every city or village has their own chocolatiers, uh, over 320 in total. And when I talk about chocolatiers, I'm really talking about the individual mom and pop store chocolatier, not the mass producers that of course also exist in Belgium. Take for example, Godiva. Uh, a ton of chocolate museums out there you can uh, sign up uh, for a chocolate workshop where you're, when you're in a destination and your travel uh, agent, travel advisor can book that for you. You can do a chocolate tour. And we really eat chocolate, we cook with it, and we use it for health benefits and wellness because I'm sure you've heard that dark chocolate is really healthy for you. Belgian waffles, of course, and uh, great, great experience as well. Uh, Belgian fries eaten, of course, with mayonnaise. That is the traditional way, but no worries. If you don't like mayonnaise, you can always add your ketchup or my favorite topping is actually curry. And of course, mussels and Brussels. So we really take care of you. You do not need to bring your own food. We have excellent food in Belgium. Also, let's take it up one level and talk about the high-end fine dining experiences. Um, when you talk about high-end fine dining, typically what comes to mind is the Michelin restaurant guide. So we have Michelin star rated restaurants in a destination. And every now and then I you know, get comments uh, when I bring it up and people, they're surprised that we do have Michelin star rated restaurants in a destination. And they tell me they had no idea and they just don't know how many we have. And they think maybe three or four Michelin star restaurants are in our destination. And I say, no, not three or four, that's not true. We have a few more. And why don't you tell me, yes, I'm happy to tell and disclose the number of Michelin star rated restaurants that we have. In total right now, it is 128 restaurants that have a Michelin star. I am not kidding. It is impressive and it is a really wow experience when you go to each and every single one of them. Um, let's just maybe sidetrack a little bit and just uh, give you a little bit of an interesting trivia about Michelin star dining, because personally I find it's very interesting. So when we talk about a Michelin guide, we typically talk about the Michelin vet guides. You see the picture, they are red. They've been published annually since 1900 and Yes, you are right. It's the same company that produces the tires. The Michelin Tire Company first published them in France to boost tire sales. The Belgian edition has been around since 1904. Uh, the inspectors really work completely anonymous and really independent to make sure it's an unbiased rating of the restaurants. The star rating, as we know it of today, was developed between 1926 and 1936. Um, now, what do the stars actually really mean? A one star rating is a very good restaurant in its category, or in other words, it's a restaurant that is worth a stop on the tour that you are on. A two star rating is an excellent, provides excellent cooking, it's worth a detour from the tour that you're on. And three stars is exceptional cuisine worth a special journey just by itself. So by Michelin telling you where to eat, they hoped that you would drive more, burn out your tires, and eventually they would sell more tires. So that is the whole background story to the Michelin dining guide. So, in total combination, we have 152 stars. So the 128 restaurants have 152 stars. 75% of the Michelin star rated restaurants are actually in our region, which means 25% uh, are in the balloon part. We have one three-star restaurant, 22 two-stars, and 105 one-star rated restaurants. To underline our expertise in cooking, in gastronomy, there's over 17,000 restaurants, over 10,000 pubs, 22 hotel management schools, over 2,000 chocolate shops. Just Bruges alone has over 
50 chocolate shops and also the world's largest chocolate producer, not just a beer producer, is actually also located in Flanders. So hopefully I can uh, just create some interest in exploring our destinations just for the food alone. Dining is really like a national pastime. There's a lot of unique locations. We've talked about the stars, the restaurants, the chefs are very talented and we actually have an internal competition, almost um, um, like a competition where they have to win and cook for prices. And the chefs are then promoted. The frites, the Belgian fries, are also an intangible government national heritage. Different unique locations where you can eat in a castle, along the canals. Uh, there's lots of food events that you can also visit as a visit to this destination. There's gastronomy where they cook with beer, like beef stew simmered in a stout. Excellent, excellent food. And of course, you can also book maybe a cooking class um, with a Michelin star chefs where you might pick up a couple of tricks of the trade. So great, great experience. And by the way, let me tell you, the food is not expensive. If you thought Michelin star dining is cost prohibitive because it costs an arm and a leg, it is not. My last Michelin star dinner in Bruges uh, was six courses uh, for the food portion that did not include the wine. So the food alone, six courses was 59 euro. So I think that should be in everybody's budget to at least visit the Michelin star restaurant once. Let's talk about uh, the active wellness, the cycling aspect of our destination, because that's the reason why we can eat well, because we exercise also well, and so can you. Uh, so Flanders is an excellent cycling destination for all skill and interest levels. What I mean by that is, you might not be really the professional or the enthusiastic cyclist. You might be more on the leisure side. You just want to rent a bike for two or three hours, cycle around Bruges, and then call it a day and do other things. We can do that. We can do it really easy on the leisure side. No stress, no worries. worries. We can rent the bikes. Everything is available. Or you might fall more, a little bit more into the middle category. Yes, I am excited. I, I, I can do a half day tour. I want to be out on the canals or I can do a full day. Uh, I want to do that. I just want to rent a, a nice bike and then be out there in the countryside. Yes, we can do that too. Or you might be a little bit more on almost professional side where you say like, I want to be out there with my cycling club. You want to do five days nonstop. We can do that. So no shortage of professional cycling, leisurely cycling along the canals. It's flat, it's easy. Pack up the kids and the family. The whole cycling network is really easy to navigate. As you can see, it's all signposted. So you just look up um, your route on the map. It has all those numbers. You just take down the number and then off you go. You don't need to bring a map along. You just remember the numbers, route 12, 2, and it's just follow those numbers. The whole cycling network is over 12,000 kilometers long. It's all signposted. And you can just like easily plan all your routes in advance with an app, with a map, online. Uh, there's also thematic loops available. So if you wanted to say, okay, I want to do a route that focuses on beer or on architecture or on Peter Paul Rubens, uh, maybe on castles, easily done family friendly, for beginners, for the advanced cyclists, everything is possible. Or if you want to do a little bit more long distance cycling, really get the kilometers in, 10 routes available, uh, 1500 kilometers of long distance cycling. Let's just uh, look at a quick video. The enthusiastic aspect of cycling is covered here and then see what type of experiences those guys have. We are in Flanders at the moment, in Belgium. We're riding some amazing roads, both on tarmac, on gravel, and some cobbles as well. I think the hardest part about riding in Flanders are all the steep hills and the cobbles. Yeah, uh, we're not really used to cobbles, but after this weekend, I think... Small country lanes, tight turns, uh, that we're not used to maybe. Twisting, turning, going up and down all the time. You don't know what to expect around the next corner.
the spring for the spring classics. Find a good spot on a steep hill and watch the pros and then go ride yourself. <laughs> When we came back from riding, we went straight to a pub where we had some uh, some really nice local beers. Flanders is definitely an excellent destination for, for cycling. Uh, with the history, all the racing and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just seeped in. You can see it everywhere. Everybody knows everything about cycling and people cheer you on. So hopefully that was a little bit of an inspiration for those of you who fall more in the middle or the advanced category of enthusiastic or professional cycling. Let's briefly talk about fashion. There's literally like a very long history of fashion, cloth trading, clothes making uh, since the Middle Ages. Um, think of a tapestry, Belgian tapestry, uh, Belgian lace. It really started out several centuries ago. And what stands out today nowadays is actually the Fashion Academy in Antwerp, which is actually rated number three in the world, the third best fashion academy in the world. It's a lot of opportunities uh, for you to bring your platinum RBC or Bank of Montreal credit card and go shopping, shop until you drop. You got international designers, you got local designers, good great prices in the destination and of course by the way you also get the sales tax the value added tax back because you're exporting them you're bringing them back home the clothing go shopping for gloves shoes hats dresses skirts ties for guys you know sometimes you get our fashion needs as well tailor-made custom-made clothing and of course diamonds antwerp is still the diamond capital of the world uh, depending on what type of diamond you're talking about, up to 80% of the world's diamonds are still cut and traded in Antwerp. Of course, the diamond mining does not happen in Belgium. No mining, you know, that's done in Canada, South Africa, but the diamond cutting and trading, that's where Antwerp still very much excels. Um, and then last but not least, our fifth usual suspects, the historic World War I sites, you know, West Flanders, Flanders Fields, where a lot of the battle sites of 1914 to 1918 are, you know, think of Ypres, Passchendaele. So a great way to retrace uh, Canadian history in uh, museums, in the trenches, on battlefield tours. Um, we really uh, had a big commemorative uh, four years uh, between 2014 to 18. But of course, the sites are still there. They're not going anywhere. The museums are there. Um, it's, it's a great way to, again, relive and, and reconnect. Also, you know, think about, you know, um, with uh, the poppies uh, coming up now. And what you see here is also uh, in the middle of the image here, the Broding Soldier, the Canadian War Memorial in Flanders. So if you have any interest uh, in that, uh, there is still a lot to see, a lot to experience. And I would definitely encourage everyone uh, to spend at least a day there. Uh, you know, visit the John McRae site where he worked, uh, wrote the poem in Flanders Fields. So it's so definitely, definitely worth it. And of course, right there, you're in the hop growing region as well, where they grow the hops and then visit the hop museum, eat at a good restaurant. So everything is very, very close. So let's uh, venture on to our third uh, thematic uh, element, the off the beaten path experience, now that we've talked about our usual suspects. And there are a lot of off the beaten path experiences um, in terms of regions, for example, our coast and the Ardennes, but also explore a couple of other areas. Uh, the coast uh, line is relatively short in Belgium. It's not a lot long coastline. But it's relatively easy to reach. Um, it offers a relaxing, family-friendly atmosphere. You can just, you know, walk around the beach, have fun, 
uh, relax. Um, or if you want to do sunbathing, uh, that is also possible. Um, so that is not a picture from somewhere down in the Caribbean where people are out there getting a tan. This is actually Belgium, uh, believe it or not. Uh, you can also experience another UNESCO World Heritage, actually shrimp fishing on horseback, uh, which is also an intangible UNESCO World Heritage. It's done the traditional way on horseback, where they ride out into the water and fish for shrimp in this way. Um, the coast is also known for great uh, art installations, art museums, art events. Um, think of maybe James Ensor in Ostend. Uh, if you've heard of that artist uh, in the 19th century, uh, the Enzo House uh, just got uh, reopened, uh, refurbished with new exhibitions. And of course, there's also great restaurants, great bars, Michelin star rated restaurants. So a great way to spend some time in a little bit more of a place that is not usually on the forefront of people's minds. Let's talk about the Flemish Ardennes, which is uh, south in the southern part of Flanders, uh, which offers a tranquil area with rolling hills, uh, small villages, perfect for cycling, hiking. Uh, you can uh, be also going to an area called Limburg, which is the north uh, east of Belgium, uh, which is a great also destination for cycling experiences. There's a cycling network uh, which takes you up into the trees, uh, cycling through the trees or through lakes here. So again, there's remote areas uh, which are great for remote activities, nature activities. Uh, you can go also hiking in forests, actually very close to uh, Brussels. Hellebrus is just south of Brussels. Great way to spend some time away from the big city, national parks. Moving on to castles. Castles is actually a very interesting aspect of our destination experiences because we have the highest numbers of castles in Europe if you calculate it per square mile or square kilometer. Uh, there's over 3,000 of those in the small area. 400 of those are accessible to the public, uh, which means 2,600 are still private residences. Uh, Unfortunately, I do not own one of those castles, but uh, who knows, maybe one day, keep dreaming. <laughs> There's all types of different castles. They are you know, out in the countryside. Um, they are combining great museum experiences with where you can see artwork in the castles. They are in the city. Here's a castle in the city of Antwerp, or also hotels in castles. Um, here is a castle in the Limburg area where you can actually stay overnight and experience the destination in a little bit of a different way, away from your usual suspect mass chain hotel. Another off the beaten path, uh, interesting experience typically for Belgium are actually Belgian comics. Comics are big, they're part of everyday life. Uh, interestingly, Printed magazine circulation is actually interesting. You know, everybody's talking about print going away and everything's becoming digital. Not for comics in Belgium, they're actually increasing. And Belgium is really famous for a lot of comics. So, Comic Strip Museum, various comic museums, a lot of events centered around comics. For example, what you see here a couple of murals painted on uh, houses in Brussels, and you can actually take uh, one of those walks that takes you. Uh, on to see all those different murals in the city of Brussels. Some of the most famous cartoons coming out of Belgium are actually the Smurfs. So those little blue guys are actually Belgian cartoons. Uh, Tintin, or the one that I grew up with is Lucky Luke and the Dalton brothers. So you can actually see it in the mural in the background here. This is supposed to be a cowboy that, uh, you know, typically Wild West type of experiences. Uh, probably not very well known in Canada or in North America in general, but uh, I personally grew up with Lucky Luke and it was just a fun, fun comic. Um, if you're a museum buff, absolutely the destination to visit. Uh, the whole country, the whole destination is loaded with museums for all interests, all different sizes, as we've already said, like comic museums. Uh, car museums like Auto World in Brussels, Train World, a train museum. They are just the right size, not 
too big. Uh, the car museum, which you actually can see here in the background, is in the former exhibition hall. They got continuously changing, rotating exhibitions. You know, one day they focus on Italian cars, then the next might be Volkswagen. So all these different rotating experiences. Spend an hour and a half there, and you have a very enriching experience. Train world is interesting because Belgium was home to the first uh, rail line in continental Europe. Of course, in Europe overall, the UK had the first uh, rail line, but in continental Europe, it was actually Belgium that had the first rail line. Uh, Diamond Museum in Antwerp, uh, quite interesting, where you can learn about all the different uh, diamonds and the mining and the cutting. Uh, the Royal Institute of Natural Sciences, which is actually the small image here, uh, so to speak, the Belgian edition of the Smithsonian, where you find uh, great, great exhibitions, dinosaur skeletons, and globally, international, it's actually ranked number three as well in the world. If you just want to have a little bit of fun and learn about potatoes and fries, then go to the Fry Museum. You might think, why would I want to go to a Fry Museum? I'd just like to eat them and enjoy them. Trust me, it's definitely worth a visit. You learn so much about potatoes and where they come from and, and the growing and how then potatoes are turned into fries. Of course, don't forget your chocolate museum, your beer museum, your fashion museum, and a ton of art museum, the classic mosses, the Flemish masters, you know, the uh, Rubens van Eyck, but also modern art. So Brussels alone, for example, is over 80 museums. So there's something for everyone. And then last but not least of our off the beaten path experiences, let's uh, maybe venture away from the usual suspect, the beer. Because it's like everybody thinks Belgium is beer, but it's more than just beer. There's also now a very increasing number of great Belgian wines uh, with the climate overall becoming warmer. Uh, Belgium actually is producing very, very good and great white wines. Um, the challenge is that the production is still very much small scale, so they don't really export any of the Belgian wines. And to taste them, you have to come, you have to be there. Uh, Belgium whiskey, uh, beer brewers are getting into whiskey distilling. Uh, also great Belgian whiskeys out there. I've toured a couple of whiskey distilleries, great, great experience away from uh, the Belgian beers. And then, of course, uh, Belgian Genevers, um, Belgian gins. Uh, you think maybe the British invented uh, gin, but it's actually originated more or less in the lowlands, the low countries, which, of course, are present-day Belgium and the Netherlands. So that's where it comes from. So great, great experiences, more than just beer. To wrap it up, let me give you a couple of uh, practical tips when you come to the destination. So in Flanders, the number one uh, language is uh, Dutch, but everybody speaks English. So don't worry about it. Everybody is English speaking. And there is uh, some French, of course, uh, in our region, and that is predominantly Brussels. If you were to break it down, 85% uh, is, is French speaking in Brussels, and then 15% is Dutch speaking in Brussels. But as said, you know, with uh, English being so dominant, everybody speaks English. Uh, the electrical current is 230 volts, so you basically just uh, need to bring an adapter if you want to plug in your computer, your cell phone, because the plugs are the round ones, not the rectangular ones. Uh, Belgium is on the euro. Credit cards are widely accepted, so don't worry about you know bringing a lot of cash or travel checks. Credit cards are fine. A lot of the cities offer city cards. Um, what it is is basically, for example, you buy the Brussels or the Antwerp city card for a day, two days, three days, and it combines a free entrance to all the city museums, public transportation. Um, other experiences like bike rentals, canal boat tours on, in one single city card. So instead of uh, paying individual museum for museum, paying for your bus, your subway, uh, your bike rental separately, just buy a city card and have everything taken care of. Stores are typically open between 10 in the morning and 6 in the evening. The time zone is the Central European time, which is um, Eastern time plus 6 or Mountain time, 
uh, plus eight hours. And you do not typically tip in Belgium. So that is interesting um, because people, the service, the taxi drivers all make living wage. So when your restaurant uh, lunch says it's um, 1950, you pay 1950. Um, so tips don't are included. You do not tip separately. Of course, if somebody goes above and beyond, they gladly accept a tip, but typically you don't need to worry about that. So with that being said, it brings us slowly to the end of the presentation. I have just one more video to show you. And this video talks specifically about the Flemish masters. So what Flemish masters traditionally meant were the great masters of art. The Peter Paul Rubens, Jan van Eyck, Bruegel, that create all those great artworks that still can be seen in the destination. But by now you should have seen that also there's modern masses of modern Flemish uh, skill sets and craftsmanship, you know, the Michelin star chefs, the beer brews, the chocolatiers. So it makes this eclectic mix of old Flemish masters and new Flemish masters. And this video combines those experiences into one. So let's just watch it. For ages, Flanders has been home to the old masters. Still today, Flanders is the place where new ideas are born against a historical backdrop. Are you ready to explore? Nibble on the chocolate beard of Rubens' self-portrait. Experience the winter in Flanders like white powder on your waffles or pedal your way through Brogelian landscapes. Adore the mystic lamb in the Ghent altarpiece, showing the holy traditions. When Icarus falls, Antwerp's fashion catches. Observe Van Eyck, the first master of oil painting. As a true Margarita Van Eyck, eat Belgian fries with pride and enjoy the craftsmanship of one of Belgium's foamiest beers. Where Rubens' cross descents move on the lines of his art. Taste the history of Flanders' culinary treasures. Be a Bruegel rebel angel and party in the land of tomorrow. Come to the heart of Europe to wear, taste, hear, smell, show and honour our Flemish masters. Together, they make Flanders state-of-the-art. Are you ready to stir your senses? So that basically wraps up my little virtual tour to Flanders, uh, Belgium. I hope you uh, got some inspiration. You got some uh, new ideas um, that we have some great destination experiences for you to offer. Uh, maybe you haven't thought of us before, so give us a chance whenever the time is right to travel again next year. Thank you. Awesome. We are inspired. Thank you so much, Marco. That was an excellent presentation and a great uh, love that you incorporated the videos. It uh, just brings it more to life. So that was just amazing. Thank you. Um, I just, I'll just see if we have any questions. Otherwise, I was going to ask you a couple. Uh, okay, I don't think we have any right yeah. at the moment. Yeah, I know you really covered it all. I think that uh, it really gave everybody a, a little taste of of what the experiences can be. And I must say, I was really quite surprised with the uh, um, all the Michelin restaurants. Oh my goodness! Right. Me too. And even right. how Michelin was formed that was very fascinating. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it is. I, I agree. And. 
I said, um, a lot of people don't know the background story to that. And sometimes they're surprised, wait a minute, this is the tire company and then the, they do the rest of this, the same company? Yes, it is. Awesome. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask your personal favorite time of year to go to Belgium. Um, anytime is a good time to go. And, and I'll tell you why. Personally, it doesn't matter you know, what country you're in. My favorite time is springtime. Uh, in general, because uh, in terms of it's the right temperature for me, it's not too cold, it's not too hot. It's kind of like feels almost like a new beginning, an awakening. Mm -hmm. um, so personally, my favorite time is springtime, and it's a great time to visit the destination. If you want it a little bit warmer, saying like for, for me, again, it's an individual experience. Maybe spring is a little bit too cool. So you prefer more the summer. You want to spend maybe a little bit more time at the beach, you know, dip into the water, then of course go in the summer. If you might be saying like, okay, I don't like maybe a lot of people around me or specifically with you know, COVID and social distancing, maybe I go during off season. So fall is also great, you mm -hmm. know, less people in destination. Or you might say, I'm really into Christmas markets and I want to see all those like gingerbread castles and, and the mullet wine. Belgium also has some great Christmas markets. And unlike the German Christmas markets, which punctually closed down on the 23rd of December and then shut down, the Belgian ones go on until the beginning of January. Oh, wow. So even if you're there between, let's say, Christmas and New Year's, you can still go to the Christmas market. Oh, good so time. any time is a good time to go. <laughs> oh, excellent. Okay, good answer. <laughs> uh, um, and then I was just going to ask you about just the various ways of traveling around Belgium. Do you, would you recommend staying in one spot, everything's close and just taking the train? Or do you think uh, renting a car? Or the, I know there's the canal, um, canal boating. Right, right. So it, it depends um, on, again, on your preference. Anything is possible except maybe flying around a destination because it's so short, it doesn't make sense to fly. So if you just want to unpack once and then from there venture out, pick any city that you like because everything is so close. It doesn't matter if you pick Brussels, if you pick Ghent, Bruges or Antwerp or Mechelen or whatever, it does not matter. Just unpack once and then from there, either take the train, take the car, I mean, trains run very frequently. You miss one train, you wait 10, 15 minutes, there's another train to the next destination. So super easy to travel by public transport, by, by car if you want to, it depends what you want to do. Or some people might say, I really wanna dive into the authentic local experience. So when I visit Brussels, I wanna stay in Brussels. When I visit Antwerp, I wanna be in Antwerp, and stay mm -hmm. overnight, they can do that too. Or, no kidding, if you're up to that, you can cycle around the destination. I've done a one-week cycle around a whole destination trip. So if you want to cycle from Brussels to Bruges, you can do that. No problem at all. Just hire a van company that hauls your luggage to the next hotel, swing yourself on a bike, and then you bike to Bruges. Possible. Awesome. <laughs> so fun. I yeah, love so that. great. And I love that the bike uh, routes are numbered. That's such a, that's such a great idea. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit of a background story. That was actually done by a mining engineer that worked in underground mining. And before the system was invented by him, he was a little bit frustrated because it was not clear. You always had to remember on Main Street, take the third road left and then get onto whatever, Autumn Avenue. And then you had to remember all those streets. And it just doesn't make sense. It's way too complicated. And then he knew how they um, numbered everything underground in the mines, which is also a numbering system. And they basically brought this on top of the surface. They laid a whole grid across the country and basically applied the underground mining numbering system to above ground. And that's how they came up with a numbering system. How oh, incredible. That's genius. It is. Um, and the, perfect. And then just uh, one question about the biking. Um, the, so obviously people can rent bikes there and then are there different um, routes that I get it's pretty flat so uh, but there's are there different levels like if you looked at a map are there different levels like maybe based on distance or something. No, it's not. It's not like your ski map where it says like, uh, you know, easy and intermediate and uh, black and double black or so. Um, I mean, everything is, is, is pretty easy um it doesn't give you like a, a, a level of difficulty per se um but um 
you know, it, it should be kind of like pretty obvious, you know, when you, when you plan a route, if you're a little bit uh, more in the south and you want to retrace, you know, some of the elements of the Tour of Flanders, you know, which is this professional bike race, you can do that. Uh, there's a couple of climbs in there and it gets hilly. Uh, you are aware of that and it, it's pretty obvious, but the, the hills itself are not very steep. But let's say you're an everyday cyclist, there's nothing to worry about. There's not like a climb in there that you cannot master. It's, it's okay. flat, it's easy, don't worry about it. Okay, and I know e-bikes are, are really popular, so probably also- Right, right, which is, personally, you know, I consider myself more like the passionate, hardcore cycling enthusiast. You know, I want the real bike, and then I'm out there biking, and then you see sometimes, you know, like retirees on the e-bike passing, it's like, oh, they're passing me, I'm <laughs> up here, it's like, oh. <laughs> And again, you got to work off the waffles. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Well, you're so knowledgeable, Frank, uh, Marco. And I think um, once our clients start traveling, we'll have to get back to you with some of your favorite um, chocolate shops and, and breweries and that to, to pass along. So that's Absolutely. wonderful. Absolutely. So, yeah. so, and also made so to keep in mind, you know, uh, the, the whole destination is for like a, a value destination. By value destination, uh, I mean, it's not expensive to visit the destination. You know, you, for example, like, you know, you, you go to Hawaii, you know, they have to import all the food, everything needs to flown in. So, you know, your cost of living is expensive. Your, your food bill will be expensive, not in Belgium. You go to a restaurant, you pay a very reasonable, um, uh, you know, amount of money. I mean, when was the last time you went to a pub and you ordered a pint of beer and you paid one euro 80? Mm. It wow. does happen in Belgium. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's wow. a price that you still end up, not for every single one, but yes, the, the cost, the hotels, you get so much more value for your money. Yeah. You thought, okay, we want to do Paris and maybe I can only afford a three or four star in Paris. You can afford a five star in, in, in Belgium for the same price. So a tremendous amount of value. Thank That's great. Well, yeah, it is, and it's a, that. yeah, and it's a really great option because a lot of people might be heading on a longer journey and stopping over in Amsterdam, for example, and maybe they've been to Amsterdam before or maybe a couple of times. You know, this is a really great suggestion to kind of head out, go to um, Belgium and experience that for, you know, even three, four days. Mm -hmm. You know, right, right. it might be just a, a different experience for you. Absolutely. It's yeah. so close, as I said, you know, everything is under two hours. Yeah. And I mean, you can, e you, can, you can even as like be as adventurous and say, okay, yes, I want to do Paris and, and London and Amsterdam and, and Brussels on my trip, but I'm going to base myself in Brussels. And from there, I'm going to do day trips to Paris. I'm going to do a day trip to London. It is possible. There are people that work in Paris, but live in Brussels. And they commute on a train every day because the cost of living is just so much cheaper. Hmm. Well, that's good to know. So in, in my casual, casual phrase, Paris is a suburb of Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Or the other way around, depending on how you yeah, see it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Marco. We really yes. appreciate your enthusiasm, your insight and knowledge. And um, Absolutely. we'll definitely be in touch. Can't wait to start traveling again and um, sending people your way. And uh, thanks again for all of our attendees, again, for being with us today. It's such a pleasure to serve you in this way. So, Well, thank um, you. I really appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate to tell you a little bit about uh, the destination. Uh, greetings to Alberta. I'm looking forward to the time when I can come back. You know, still got a lot to explore there as well. You know, I've, I've been around. I've, I've seen a lot in Alberta, but there's still more to discover. So I'm looking Absolutely. forward to my time Love back there you. as well. Yeah. You're welcome <laughs> anytime. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Have a great evening, everyone. Yes. Bye, Goodbye, everybody. Have a great Bye. night. Thanks again, Marco. Thank Bye. You. Bye.